Welcome to Season 3 of Swiss Impact with Banerjee. I'm Sveta. And I'm Ben. The topic of Season 3 is Impact Investing, the new normal. Do you also want to do something meaningful for our planet and people or invest with impact? Then our amazing and powerful guests who are business owners, heads of financial institutions, thought leaders, political leaders, policy makers, investors and experts. Greetings, my name is Ash Pachori and I'm the senior mentor of the POP or Protect Our Planet movement and also a member of the board and secretary treasurer of the World Sustainable Development Forum. Our primary goal is to mobilize the 1.8 billion youth of the world to urgently address the issue of climate change and take action to protect our planet. This will inspire you to get engaged. And in this season, we will challenge them even more to take actions towards sustainable development goals to enable paradigm shifts in the financial sector and way of doing business. Watch and learn how can we, as humans, transform into eco-financial system which would serve all people and the environment. We aim for impact investments to become available to anyone, become truly mainstream. See you every Friday at 3 p.m. Central European Time at Swiss Impact with Energy. Act for your future. Good morning, afternoon, and evening to everyone and to our viewers from Far East. Good night. Welcome back to week 10 of season three. Our show is about impact investment. The theme of this season is impact investing, the new normal. What do we mean by that? <laughs> Today morning, I was actually a very early morning at 7 <laughs> 20 uh, speaking at Russian Perm uh, Social Entrepreneurs Conference, right? So even they are already uh, talking about impact investing and trying to get Swiss and European capital. So very ambitious indeed. <laughs> However, we really aim that the capital would be available to every part of on every part of our planet and in order to make it a better place for all. So driving force for achieving sustainable development goals is impact investment in our opinion. Thank you. And although we are very aware that people from Canada, <coughs> including from First Nation citizens to members of diverse small and medium enterprise organizations in India and Mexico are watching us now. But still, before we continue, a quick reminder to you to subscribe to our YouTube channel not to miss any future exciting episodes. The channel, very easy, youtube.com slash Swiss Impact. And for those who have no idea what we are talking about, what is impact investing, what is a profitable business with impact, you can check chamomile.ch. There will be four upcoming courses starting next week. You can join them. Of course, we would be very happy to see you with us. Ben, before we invite our guests of today, I'm really excited <laughs> to hear their story. Would you share your story instead? Okay, so all of us who read news is aware of the COP26, which is now going on. Before anybody asks what is COP26, <laughs> it is the 26th Climate Change Summit organized by the United Nations, bringing nearly all the countries together. And COP stands for Conference of the Parties. This year, it is taking place in Glasgow, Scotland, under the presidency of UK, and I think Italy is also involved. Mm -hmm. I agree with Greta, Greta Thunberg when she said at the BBC, COP26 has been a failure and a PR exercise. Last week, I mentioned of the unbelievable promise made by 100 countries to stop with climate change. One just as important news did not get much coverage in European news. How many of you are aware that nearly 20 countries committed to stop financing fossil energy projects? And do you know which countries are on the list? United States, United Kingdom, Canada, and even European Investment Bank. Wow, since we in Europe are so environmentally conscious and telling the world how to protect and take care of environment, so all European countries must have signed, including the Netherlands, your country, <laughs> no? Well, this time I'm ashamed to say that the only European countries who signed are Italy, Denmark, United Kingdom, and of course, Finland. But the countries which do the most financing of such projects, like Germany, France, the Netherlands, and even Switzerland, did not sign. 
and none of the Asian countries, which are the biggest backers of such projects within G2, G20, like China, Japan and South mm. Korea, also did not sign. So it seems that despite of all evidences and facts pointing otherwise, the right-wing conservative leaders like Angela Merkel, Rutte, etc., still think that economy is much more important than climate change. Can you please explain why <laughs> and how the government supports fossil fuel energy industry? Well, I can only speak on behalf of Netherlands, although I'm sure that countries like Germany have similar reasons. First, your question was why? Well, the Dutch companies have relatively large investments in international oil and gas sector. And how? The Dutch government supports international fossil energy projects or, or this form of support consists of government guarantees and export credit insurances, like for construction of gas and oil pipes for companies like Shell, Boscalis. Boscalis is one of the digging companies. And without the government guarantees, these projects cannot be insured. And Netherlands is a world is a huge player in the world in this market. So of course they are reluctant to sign this. Anyway, in conclusion, we often quote and speak of the countries from the north. On other hand, I will highly advise our viewers to listen to the short eight and a half or nine minute speech of Her Excellency Mia Motley, the Prime Minister of Barbados, who spoke at the COP26. She really spoke so very well about the threats and the issues they are facing facing and the consequences of our actions by our i mean from the north which is going to which is happening to the people on the other side of the gold of the globe and i admire really i'm speaking sarcastically the stoic faces of the western leaders when they just sit and listen knowing very well that most of what they are doing or is talking is empty air mm -hmm. Yes, thank you, Ben, for this very positive story <laughs> of today. And I also actually listened to the speech of Mia, and it's deeply touching how um, she speaks, where, in which situation we are now. And uh, I also advise to listen to it. Let's go now to our guest from your country, the Netherlands. I'd like to invite the dear guests Frank Kroon and Dirk Gevers. Hello, hello. <laughs> welcome. Hello. Welcome, welcome, Frank. Uh, thank welcome, you for welcome. having us on your show. Are you are you in Netherlands right now? Absolutely. Yeah. I am in Netherlands. So I'm outside of Munich. Oh, okay. Okay. Oh, we talked about Germany <laughs> <laughs> just before. <laughs> <laughs> before before we come to our questions, I'd like to briefly introduce you and let's start with you, Frank. So you are a senior entrepreneur who built many companies, including Telford. And Ben, did you know that? That uh, uh, Frank actually started with a team of 60 people and grew the company up to 1,600, having an annual turnover of more than 400 million euro. I just knew Telford, <laughs> but I preferred KPN for my telephone. <laughs> <laughs> and Frank, you did the same for many other companies like Via Intercom, Comp Completel, etc. I don't know all of them. And also you did such projects um, like Westpac, BT, and of course the Dutch tax office. I'm you very curious whether he worked at the Dutch tax office before all the problems started or after the problems. We can ask <laughs> him later on. <laughs> you worked around the globe before starting BMAP in 2018 with the vision to deliver the most comfortable and efficient mobility service available. So you have three kids, by the, by the way, <laughs> on the side and amazing wife. You live in Leiden, one of Ben's favorite city and students hanging out place. Yeah, I used to be a student member there, but it's a long time ago. Oh, yeah. Now to you, Dirk. Dirk. Yes. Um, so <laughs> you come from South Africa, where oh. you started your mechanical engineering career at the South African Power Utility and later at Unilever Margarine Factory. Wow, that's an interesting. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, Unilever is uh, also promoting themselves as a very sustainable company. And at various factories of B BMW, at BMW, you manage the department that is responsible for the complete body quality of all global product launches. 
And of course, your amazing experience internationally proved your organizational skills, leadership values, and it drives to build something new to the team all the time. <laughs> you love to do sports, play the trombone, and learn new skills. Currently in cryptocurrencies, like your brother Johan, an old friend of Ben. Yeah. <laughs> okay. You live outside of Munich, as you said, with your amazing wife and children, three children as well. And the golden retriever. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and, and, yeah. and about your company, Beamima, we will hear from you just now. So let's exactly. start with yeah. your business, Impactful Business. So Frank, Derek, welcome again. And can you please introduce yourself in a way what I still didn't <laughs> say? And what has been your motivation to start this venture? <clears throat> and, yeah. and being a Trekkie myself, I love the name Beam Me Up. Why did you forget Scotty? <laughs> <laughs> Scotty will be with us later. Uh, so uh, we have plans for that, but we'll incorporate that uh, in a little while. Take some time. But we'll get there. Mind this space. So I got uh, fascinated by mobility about 30 years ago. I was visiting in Thailand um, and didn't have a car there, but I got around with the red, back, red cap uh, system in Chiang Mai, which was a perfect system, very efficient. Uh, dirt cheap and it got me anywhere I wanted to go in a fair amount of time. So I was, I've always been figuring out how to get that to Western Europe uh, at some sort of mm -hmm. time. So I, since then I developed a lot of large search providers. Uh, I got engaged with all latest IT developments, including data science and machine learning solutions. And I now think we have all the components available to implement an advanced form of that uh, shared mobility in Western Europe and uh, scale that up um, and do that in a sustainable way so that basically everybody benefits. So that was my main motivation to start Beam Me Up and uh, building it from there. What about you, Dirk? My motivation um, for, for becoming co-founder of, of Beam Me Up uh, really has two roots. And, and one of them is I grew up in South Africa on a farm and my father used to plant crops and we would be dependent on the rain. We would be dependent on the weather. So I learned very early on uh, to appreciate the nature and to look after nature and to, to develop a sense not only for plants, but for animals and everything that has to do with in nature and, and how delicate the balance is that we need to keep. Also, my passion for engineering and technology started on the farm because we always had machines that, which sometimes were broken and needed to be repaired. Uh, so that um, kind of laid one uh, ground stone for me. The other one is I spent the last 20 years working at BMW in Munich and internationally. And BMW has, has been one of the leaders in um, electric mobility with the i3 and the i8. So sustainability has been in, in the DNA of, of BMW for a long time. So this is something that grew on me. And I've always loved cars and I've always loved mobility. So combining these two uh, for me was the perfect opportunity uh, to join Beam Me Up and, and to, to really build something that is impactful, uh, that can really make a difference to the environment and at the same time deliver a fantastic service to, uh, to customers around the world. Mm -hmm. Can one or both of you describe what is the offering of BMAP, the company that uh, you're building? Right. So let's start with uh, our <coughs> objective of making an impact. We're taking that seriously. So making an impact in mobility means we have to scale up to mass volumes. And how can we scale up to mass volumes is by providing an excellent mobility service. It needs to be top notch for every individual user. So what we are delivering is instantly available. It's as fast as a dedicated car, but much cheaper. So we will drive you to your destination always. 24 by 7. And with that, we are growing a multi-billion dollar euro business. Um, so the way we do that also means that we are accelerating the energy transition for mobility. So we are doing that on a near zero carbon footprint. And that means uh, as we scale up that the entire um, human 
humanity is benefiting as well. So what we uh, offer is a mobility service based on a fleet of electrical vehicles. Uh, we, we make cars available to any individual user who wants to go there, uh, go anywhere. And we do that within five minutes. So typically that means that for every 10 subscribers, we need one car. And mm -hmm. relative to what we have at the moment, that means a factor 10 reduction in the number of cars we use, plus the fact that all our cars will be electrical vehicles. So um, also as part of our model, we are sharing our vehicles. So we reduce the total number of vehicles on the road. Uh, with the reduction of um, vehicles, we reduce the parking spaces uh, with a factor of 10, which ultimately uh, frees up uh, twice the area of uh, our capital Amsterdam in the Netherlands and a similar space in any other country we're operating in. And we will use way less resources for the production of vehicles. So uh, to be short, we have an excellent service providing a unique user experience for uh, a reduced cost to the users and having a very significant impact on the carbon footprint of one It sounds very exciting. You know, impact investors love to hear impact and multi-billion <laughs> dollar business. <laughs> that combination is uh, fantastic. Yeah, it's a unicorn. And, and, and Derek, you have to add something to what Frank said? No, I think that's uh, beautifully formulated. Okay, so uh, then we go to the next one because I know, logically speaking, cars are one of the worst possible form of investment. You buy something for a considerable amount of money, you use it less than 5% of the time per day, and for the rest, it is just standing and losing value with each passing day. Exactly. So uh, my question was that, but still people want to own it because they want to feel at home, outside of home a private space for himself or herself. That's why I noticed that car sharing initiatives like mobility in Switzerland is not as it did not grow as fast as people had expected. So what do you think of that? What is your what is the offering of beam up different in this way that it will attract people still to get rid of their car or not to buy or invest in a car anymore and use your services? Yeah. So our three main Characteristics of our service are instantly available, fast, and cheap. So if you look at, for example, any existing car sharing offering, and you score them at uh, those three characteristics, you will instantly say that they're not instantly available. You have to plan them well ahead, because if in the middle of your night uh, you need to rush into the hospital, then you're never guaranteed that that uh, shared car, shared vehicle will be available. We are offering commitment to our users of being available on the 24 by seven within five minutes. So that's a big difference. Uh, so if you took at, if you look at uh, the speed of operation, uh, we have a five minute lead time, but we'll make that up at the destination because we park at the, the doorstep of, of the destination, people get out and do not need to fill in a parking meter, do, do not need to, walk back to their destination, they can just uh, immediately go about their business. So we are faster than, than even a private car. Mm -hmm. And then the price but will how be... How are you going to manage that, Frank? I assume that you will have to hire lots of drivers and have a lot of cars at variable hours. So how do you intend to manage that? Or do you also consider using self-driving functionality? So indeed, we will have lots of cars because we, we, we need volume, uh, but we still need about one tenth of cars uh, that we would need if, if everybody would have their own cars. So, so we, we, we have a significant reduction in the number of cars. Uh, we have a mm -hmm. significant reduction in the operational cost because we only drive electrical and electrical vehicles are maintenance free and uh, have a reduced total cost of ownership at higher mileages. So that is our, our benefit, and we pass on that best cost benefit to our, to our users. Indeed, uh, drivers uh, are a significant cost factor for that, but uh, we have an efficient model of scheduling those resources. Uh, and as far as autonomous operation is concerned, 
um, that would be a major benefit, but we are not basing our model on, on autonomous vehicles. Uh, so mm -hmm. um, we have a profitable model as of the start. And uh, once um, autonomous vehicles will be available, we will be able to include that in a, into our model. That would be cool. <laughs> so really cool. That the people would, would need to overcome the fear also uh, getting into the self-driving vehicle. <laughs> I think that will grow on people, honestly, uh, because it will go step by step. Uh, you won't just have a bang and suddenly autonomous driving is there. I think people will get used to it over a number of years. And, and I think we will see in the end um, that uh, driving autonomously is a lot safer than driving mm -hmm. yourself. And um, yeah. most people don't like to admit this, but uh, most people are not very good drivers. And, and the autonomously driven That's... cars will be a lot safer. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I just a couple of weeks back, I drove to Netherlands and on the way, you, what you said is completely true. I saw so many people who don't deserve to be on the highway <laughs> to be in the car in the last, first place. Yeah. <laughs> and you so, were driving largely autonomously or didn't you? No, no, no. My, <laughs> we are not allowed to. I mean, I have a Tesla, but we are not allowed to use the self-driving functionality yet, as far as I know. Mm -hmm. So what, uh, I think what you said is that what I like very much about your story, that your cars are all electric, especially te and especially Tesla. And mm -hmm. all of us love Tesla. So you will be contributing very strongly to the CO2 emission reduction. And do mm -hmm. you have numbers to show how much? And do you have plans to somehow capitalize on the CO2 emission saved, like carbon trading, etc.? Yeah, absolutely we do. Um, of course, I mean... Um, the whole environmental story can only be told um, if you are using electric vehicles at the moment. Hydrogen powered may come at some point in the future, but we have to be pragmatic. We are building a business, so we need to use what is available now. And electric um, uh, um, motors are the best at the moment. So, of course, we will capitalize on that. And um, the, the calculations for how much CO2 we are saving, are um, they give um, very high numbers. And, and they come from, from two sources, really. Um, the one reduction is, of course, if you're not using a fossil fuel car, but rather than an electric car, that's the one factor, because during driving, you're not emitting CO2. And the other factor is um, our scaling of one to 10. We need only one car produced, where previously 10 cars needed to be produced. So even during production, uh, CO2 is also saved uh, in a substantial way. And our calculations show that during our pilot which we are planning to do in the Netherlands with 50 cars, we will already be sa saving 8,600 tons of CO2 wow. in the first year. Great. And wow. if the scaling up goes according to plan, uh, then in the fifth year, when we have operations in the Netherlands and in Germany, we will already be saving 32 million tons of CO2 mm -hmm. a year. So I think these are, these are really big numbers, which the public maybe can, cannot really understand yet because we're not used to talking about millions of tons of CO2 and these numbers mm -hmm. all sound yeah. very big. But um, that is a substantial um, contribution. Yeah. That but, but when you mention 800, how much did you say? 806,600 8, tons. 8,600 tons. What is the total? Do you have the number of what is the total amount of CO2 being emitted by cars in Netherlands at this moment? I don't have that figure uh, ready now. Okay. I'm sorry. It would have because that would have put a uh, kind of idea about what is the size of the or the ratio we are talking about. You're right. I'm yes, sure they can check that quickly. At the moment. Mm -hmm, yeah. mm -hmm. But talking about and sustainable other... development goals and your impact, you know, guys. <clears throat> so very important for impact investors to know what kind of what, what uh, SDGs are you actually solving and contributing to? So what, uh, what are those? Could you name? Yeah. Well, we, we've gone through the, the whole, um, all the 17 uh, of the United Nations um, SDGs, and uh, we actually contribute to seven of the 17. And, and some no. of the way that the, some of the goals are formulated, they are a little bit interwoven and there's a little bit of overlap. Right. Um, but, but the most important uh, ones that we are contributing to are um, sustainable transport, mm -hmm. which uh, has the atmosphere apart, which is uh, mm -hmm. the main contribution, but also resilient infrastructure and also good health and well-being. 
I think those are the three most important ones. And um, sustainable transport is obviously the main thing. Uh, we reduce obviously CO2, which mm -hmm. we've just spoken about in a, in a significant way. But um, the, the production is also not to be neglected because there are factories all over the world, not only producing cars, but also suppliers supplying to the factories that are building cars. There's transportation of parts and of cars. So the whole value chain is producing a lot of uh, CO2. So we will be addressing that. Um, another part is, I think Frank mentioned it earlier already, the parking space. Um, if you mm -hmm. imagine the, the number, I mean, ideally our cars are not parked at all. <laughs> uh, if everybody in the world... In Switzerland, it would be parking. very good. You know, the parking is bloody expensive here. Yeah. Oh, you should know. <laughs> Netherlands is just as bad. <laughs> Amsterdam, Utrecht is a it's disaster. Terrible. Yeah, yeah, terrible. And so ideally, we don't need any parking spaces anymore. Ideally, our, our cars will pick you up from your door, deliver you to uh, your destination and not need to be parked because it then will, it will be driving on to, to pick up the next customer, which means the, the surface area, um, which in Germany would be the size of, of Munich, or is it twice the mm -hmm. size of Munich? I've forgotten. But anyway, it's a substantial space will become free. This space mm -hmm. does not need to be tarred anymore or covered with, with cement. It can be free. Mm -hmm. We can plant trees. We can we can mm -hmm. you know, build parks. So we can even uh, you know um, uh, rededicate um, uh, parking houses to residential space, uh, which wow. brings me to, to mm -hmm. the next uh, point about good health and well-being. Because our model is based on chauffeur-driven cars, people don't need to drive themselves anymore, and mm -hmm. um, which means on average in in Europe, people spend. 300 hours per year just sitting at the wheel looking at other traffic 300 <laughs> hours if you can no, it's it, not happy faces you know in no. nice cars but it's uh, with very um, it's long faces yeah. <laughs> well, and if you convert those 300 hours per year to working time that's almost two months of working time <laughs> And you know how many books you can read or how many FaceTime calls you, you can make with your beloved ones if, if you don't have to pay attention to the road anymore, but, but rather you have free time. So we are convinced that um, uh, good health and well-being is, is uh, one major impact that, uh, that we will improve. And, and, the, and the other thing is the offer we will make will be cheaper. It will mm -hmm. be cheaper than operating your own car, which means... You have more money left over at the end of the month to invest in a healthy lifestyle, be that healthy food or, or whatever, you know, doing more sport. So you will have more time and, and more money available. So I think I don't want to uh, elaborate too much, but we address some of the major parts um, of, of the SDGs. Mm -hmm. And uh, what about like in, in terms of finance, why it will be cheaper? How is it possible? You have a chauffeur, a driver there, and uh, still it will be cheaper than using a taxi or, uh, you know, your own car. But uh, I mean, are you also calculating <clears throat> that uh, how much, uh, so, say, for example, you take a village or you take a town like Leiden. Are you also calculating how many estimated percentage of the population of Leiden will be using your service and also if they use your service how many kilometers per year will each of them will using are you making models and yeah. calculating on that absolutely yeah. absolutely. absolutely so what we do is um, we assume we have a certain minimum number of subscribers for each of the cities uh, in order to make our model work so we need a minimum number of vehicles in order to guarantee our five minutes lead time mm -hmm. and our continuous continuous availability. As long as we are past that minimum threshold, we can just grow with the number of subscribers on a ratio of one to eight, one to 10. So Leiden, it doesn't matter how many people ultimately will sign up for the service because with an increasing numbers of subscribers, we will just increase our fleet and increase our, uh, mm -hmm. our operation uh, and, and just maintain the quality uh, so mm -hmm. and uh, the good thing is our marginal uh, revenues will be higher than our marginal cost of course so increasing volume will increase our profitability plus that it will increase the quality of service because mm -hmm. you know it's a game of numbers 
And I can explain that uh, basically by if we would have one subscriber, we would need one vehicle. So we have a one-on-one -on -one relationship. We also need a driver. So we would be far more expensive mm -hmm. than um, uh, the, the guy having an, an individual car. So if we have 10 subscribers, we could get away with five cars or so. But if, if we have 10,000 subscribers, then the economies work in our, in our advantage and we only need uh, maybe uh, 1,000 vehicles. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. that actually uh, is when the model starts to work for us uh, because, because we only need one-tenth of the number of vehicles, that, uh, those benefits will be passed on as cost advantages. So we have done calculations. So we get uh, at a price of about 60 cents a kilometer. That is less than the average car. Right so, mm -hmm. and that's uh, mm -hmm. ultimately uh, showing a profitable business model. So, um, and as soon as we grow further in scale, we will increase our profitability. So, we are yes, we are cheaper even with a chauffeur-driven service. So we can provide everybody their own chauffeur-driven service without uh, costing more money. And that's a big advantage. And you can compare it uh, with the times you had your video players or DVD players and you had to rent a video movie. So <laughs> nowadays, you, you don't have your own hardware anymore. You just rely mm -hmm. on the streaming service to bring your um, movies to your home straight away. So, and that's yeah. what it's going to be like with transportation as well. We bring transportation it's, to you. We don't need to operate your own hardware anymore. Frank, I, as an as a user, you know, I think um, many of people who are listening to us have the same question. So, how much will subscription cost per month? And also, what about rush hours? If everyone wants to go somewhere, how will it work? Oh, then? yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. So at yeah, the so office time, if more than ten, you have one person, uh, ten, uh, one. How do you say ten subscription for one car? But at the office time, if all the ten of them want at the same time, yeah. Well, you know, even in rush hours, it's not that everybody in a in a country is uh, on the road at that time. Mm -hmm. So we plan our fleet to cater for the for the rush hours, of course. So that those are our peak hours. Then almost any of our cars will be uh, used to, to deliver services. Um, so and we, we, we will be able to manage that, uh, but we also have in our model an incentive to share the, the cars. So we have two different subscriptions. You can ha either have an exclusive subscription in which you have the car for your own party all the time, or a shared subscription and of course, a shared subscription will be even economical, more economical than, than an exclusive subscription. But then if How you much actually... it will cost those? <laughs> All right. <laughs> uh, if you so... can disclose, you know, if you can, it's fine. <laughs> oh, yeah, no, 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 sure. So the, the pricing will be uh, around uh, a monthly subscription for 500 kilometers will be about 300 euros. Mm -hmm. And yeah, you that's, can that's use fair. the 500 kilometers at any moment you like 24 by 7. Mm -hmm. so whether you, you have to rush to the hospital at night or you want to uh, go to school or to your work um, at the end of the trip the, the distance will be subtracted from your account balance and that's it mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. I, I, about the video i just wanted to say I, I was few weeks back i was in delft and i took my son to see the video take from where i used to rent videos it was a three-floor gigantic building Nothing exists. Absolutely nothing. Oh. It's completely yeah. something else. Are you sad? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> the whole video thing is gone. <laughs> so, so video rental uh, shops uh, just disappeared out of the, yeah. uh, the yeah. city in, in, in about two years. Really, it, it happened so yeah. fast. It, it was almost an overnight exercise. Yeah, Ex exactly. Incredible. The world is changing. <laughs> this is what I always like to, so, to say. Yeah. But it, it, I think it will only change substantially, really, if the service that we offer to customers is both so attractive because it really just works so well mm -hmm. and is cheaper. Only then yeah. will people really adopt it and, and we will get uh, to the volume that we need to be able to really make an impact to the environment. Yeah. But it all starts with happy customers. 
exactly i had two questions on this one is uh, when as per your calculation will you go profit uh, will you be making profit is it in the first year or second year no. and and second question was that how would you manage the would you be running an ai or or artificial intelligence or something to to study the data of the customer and keep on improving at your services and okay. making it better yeah, yeah. Absolutely. I mean, if, if I may answer the, the first question, uh, our current uh, financial model um, shows that we will be profitable from the third year. Mm -hmm. So the investor uh, we are looking uh, for now uh, to invest in the startup uh, will, will need to, to bridge that gap because our profitability will start in the third year. So I think that's quite uh, common with yeah, startups. That's quite normal. That's, quite normal. Yeah. Yeah. that's what the current plan uh, shows. And I think for the question on the AI, maybe Frank, <laughs> That's more more my domain. Uh, so indeed, uh, our key capability will be the logistical intelligence. So we uh, need to pre-position our fleet to meet the five minutes lead time for our users because those that's more or less a sacred commitment to our users. And in order to do that, uh, we will uh, gather data, we will train our systems, and we will have preemptive movement of our vehicles to, to meet the five minutes. Uh, so that's actually exactly what we are developing in the pilot uh, phase. Uh, so we start with a reduced ratio of vehicles to subscribers in order to make up for uh, the intelligence uh, that uh, is, is an only in basic format available at start. But then we train our systems and we will be able to increase the, the ratio up to a factor of one to 10 ultimately. Um, but um, so, yes, we will develop the artificial intelligence to optimize our fleet relative to our subscribers. And and just one more, because what you mentioned that your business or your project is a very much number of games. That the bigger the number, the better it is. So are you also putting substantial part of your investment also into marketing? Because I think marketing will be a very important part of your business. Well, it is going to be key because ultimately um, we we are targeting a mass adoption of our model. Um, does that mean that we spend huge amount of money on marketing? No. So what we already experiencing is that we we have announced our, our pilot operations in a, in a limited uh, municipality. So we're getting uh, requirements or requests uh, for service from neighboring municipalities from other. Um, regions in the Netherlands. So we are already um, entering wait, li wait lists for other regions. And uh, so ultimately, um, we might have the same model as uh, the introduction of Gmail, which was such an improvement over uh, other existing messaging services that everybody wanted to get a, a Gmail mailbox. And um, mm -hmm. so if we get to that situation, then uh, it, it will be largely a pull from uh, from the crowd on, on incentivizing or driving the regions where we are going to roll out. And so a limited marketing experience, but uh, we, we will have the number of subscribers uh, at the start of operation in our region. So uh, that's the advantage of our model because we have subscription based revenue. Uh, as long as we have a minimum number of subscribers in the region, we can start already profitable in uh, the rollout phase. Okay. Mm -hmm. That so, sounds great, guys. Really exciting. Uh, and I would love to be in that municipality <laughs> <laughs> to try that out. He's completely well, in the north of Netherlands. There's only five people living there. <laughs> <laughs> but let's go back to uh, the impact because I yeah. see that the impact will be huge, but maybe you can specify it a bit more. So what yes. will be the impact? I think uh, one one topic um, of the SDGs that uh, th that we skipped earlier on was uh, the resilient infrastructure, and I just mm -hmm. like to get back to that point because that's so important to me. If if you operate your own car today, and it breaks down, you're stranded. Mm -hmm. If you're sitting in a train, which breaks down, you have hundreds <laughs> of people stranded. Whereas in our model, if one of our cars breaks down another one will come. Mm -hmm. uh, we are far more resilient. This, this network effect that we are striving for is far more resilient than any other form of transport. 
So this is why we really believe um, that we have a compelling offer, uh, which will you know, not only improve uh, climate and CO2 and all these things, but also just be more resilient to, uh, to, you know, to disturb, mm -hmm. which will in, in, in the end effect mean when people want to get to work, they actually do get to work. Uh, and, you know, the whole society becomes uh, more resilient. So I think that's very important. But your question was, um, I think, going in the direction of how do we measure the impact? Um, uh, yeah, exactly. What will be the impact measurement methodology and uh, how regularly are you going to report on that? Well, uh, the reporting uh, we haven't quite structured yet, but ob the obvious things that we will measure is... Um, how many kilometers did we actually travel and how does that uh, convert into uh, the tonnage of, of CO2 that, that we have saved? Mm -hmm. That's one measurement uh, that we will obviously monitor to, monitor to, uh, to report on the quality of our service. Um, the, the other very important uh, measurement to us is the number of minutes to pick up. Time. Mm -hmm. uh, because that's ultimately what the customer is interested in. If the customer uses his app and says, I want a ride, how many minutes does it take for us to arrive at his doorstep and pick him up? That's crucial because, as I said earlier, it, we will only reach mass adoption if we have happy customers. And the minutes until pickup time are a, a key metric uh, for us uh, to, to determine how happy our customers are in line or in addition, of course, to the usual uh, ways of, of determining uh, customer satisfaction. And um, another metric uh, that we are thinking of introducing is the parking space conversion. So um, we'd love to offer this opportunity or, or even maybe a challenge to the municipalities to report uh, once we've established our service in their municipality, mm -hmm. how many parking spaces have they uh, been able to convert to green, beautiful spaces? Uh, how many years it will take to get some numbers like that? Because it's more long-term impact, I would say. It's not uh, reachable in one year. Well, the, the plan is um, to start with, uh, with one municipality, obviously, in the, the pilot uh, year, and then to scale up to two municipalities. But after that, once we've proven that our system works, uh, to then have a very fast scale-up and, and mm -hmm. to, to not only uh, reach, um, uh, you know, covering the whole of the Netherlands, but also to spread to other countries. So, yes, the, the scale-up is planned to be very steep um, after the first, say, two years. So it will take eight years to get to a full nationwide coverage uh, in any country. So we have a sort of a rollout factory uh, in establishing operation in all the uh, municipalities, uh, which um, typically are about 400 in the country. Um, and each cell will be the same activities uh, for, for setting up. So eight years until full coverage and until we uh, reach 20 megatons of uh, CO2 reduction yeah. each car, or at least in the I, I just talked about something. I thought if you are living in a small village in the north of Netherlands is and your car, but suddenly somebody gets in there and says, I want to go to Maastricht. Yeah, ultimately, will you... we'll take that. Yes. So when we have nationwide coverage, it uh, doesn't matter where you want to go. We will take mm -hmm. you all the way uh, to where you want to go. So it's 250 kilometers. Okay. Um, I mean, that's why you have the subscription. Yeah, you, you can take that for any trip you like. Okay. And because the can... will be more or less, uh, say, redistributed um, um, based on uh, on the demand anyway. So, exactly. so in 10 years, you go uh, with a chauffeur <laughs> to Netherlands, to your country. <laughs> exactly. Yes. But, even but wouldn't, it, uh, but even wouldn't it take the car? But I was just thinking, wouldn't it take the car out? So you have like 10 cars for the village in the north of Holland. But then suddenly somebody says, I want to go to Maastricht. So for four or five hours, that car disappears. It's off your... Mm. Yeah. And, and another car will be going into that village from oh, okay. maybe Hull or, uh, or exactly. Utrecht, uh, so ultimately uh, that will balance out. And, and uh, if there is some unbalance, we will mm -hmm. uh, preemptively mic, um, try move the vehicles to where they need to be. So sure. that has been scientifically modeled. I will spare you yeah. the details, but we expect to have about 8% of our mileage due to the preemptive position of, of the vehicles that we need to do. 
Yeah. So yes, we need to reposition some empty vehicles, but it will be very limited uh, relative to uh, to what we do at the moment. Exactly. No, I remember because I studied electrical engineering at TU Delft, and we have 21 floor building, and one floor was only about traffic studies. Yeah. So yeah. there, there were professors who are doing research on how to calculate the traffic and to preempt it and to think forward. And it's a whole f department who is only what? focused, and I'm talking about 30 years. No, 20, 20, <laughs> <laughs> not that old. 20 years back or something. And so it is, I know it is an extremely complicated uh, logistics model that you have to kind of control and play with it. Yeah, absolutely. It, it's, uh, it's, it's very advanced mathematics, uh, data science. Uh, so, uh, yeah, th th that's uh, econometrists typically uh, as well in, in that domain. So uh, we need very we need a specialist to, to develop these solutions. Mm -hmm. uh, but you know, okay. the good news is we have developed more or less similar solutions for other domains. So we understand how to do that. So and it doesn't matter whether it was tax fraud schemes or uh, say mobile technology uh, for for roaming uh, optimization. So uh, we've done that before, and I'm sure we can do that for mobility as well. I think Ben, your your point is very important. Um, Twenty years ago, you had a whole floor of the university dedicated to uh, to traffic studies, and and the question always comes: Why is the timing right now the best timing to start this business? And I think it's also because um, much of the technology has evolved has evolved so much mm -hmm, over the last mm -hmm. years. Artificial intelligence, all these kind of uh, technologies are now available and make it possible to model such complex uh, systems. So yes, the timing is right now. Exactly. Absolutely, absolutely. No, really, uh, I would love to see something like that also in Switzerland. Anyway. Let's go to impact and opportunity because uh, we know a little bit where do you stand now, but it would be great to really, if you could say very clearly, where do you stand right now? What's your status? And BMAP is not yet fully operational or is it? And do you have already partners, clients who subscribed or who will subscribe once you start your operations? Where do you stand, guys, right now? Yeah, so for the last uh, three years, we've developed our software platforms. Uh, so those are fully uh, available. So the apps are in the app stores. Uh, the back end is uh, fully functional. The payment systems are in place. Uh, so that, that's all done. Uh, we, we have an agreement with the municipalities for our pilots. Uh, we have an agreement with Tesla to, um, to provide the vehicles uh, for our services. Uh, and uh, we have the blueprints for our operations. So everything is in place, uh, but um, the finances for our pilots. So we are currently uh, raising uh, for, for those pilots to start with uh, pilots of 50 vehicles each um, in the Netherlands uh, and in Germany. And as, uh, as soon as we have that, uh, we plan to start operation in the April, May next year timeframe. How much are you fundraising, Frank? So we are looking for five to ten million uh, in, on the initial raise. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, if Ellen is on board, I think this is very good <laughs> testimonial for fundraising. Yeah, I'm he, sure he, he will... just encashed five billion uh, from the Twitter. I thought. <laughs> well, I think he's paying that to the tax authorities. If I if I got that right. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. no. Did, didn't you know that <clears throat> these guys, Elon Musk, Jeff Bezos, they are known for not nearly not paying any taxes. Yeah. So. <laughs> and it's not the topic of today's discussion. <laughs> no, but I see it as, uh, as a huge uh, business opportunity for any impact investor. And um, so, can you explain a little bit the commercial side as well? <clears throat> yeah, so, so as we speak, uh, as, as we said earlier, we, we intend to deliver these services for a price of about 60 cents per kilometer. Mm -hmm. So any um, calculation of the cost of, a, of an average car uh, starts with about um, 70 to 70 cents per kilometer up to uh, a euro 50 per kilometer. So th that's the all included pricing uh, of it. Uh, so, so we, we, we can deliver this uh, economically uh, into the market. So what we typically use as an example is um, what if you need to buy another car next year? If you have no beam up available in your area, then you 
will just have an analysis of uh, what kind of car you would need to uh, try to arrange the financing because you need uh, a few thousand euros to, uh, to buy your car and uh, go into the dealerships. So now you have Beam Me Up in your area operation. So it's either raising a few thousand euros or, or 20 or 30,000 euros uh, for a car or buying a subscription for 300 euros a month. You get the same instant availability of the vehicles. You get the same speed in getting into your work, to your shop, to your family, uh, and you have a lower monthly fee. So what do you do? I yep. think it's, then it's it an easy be choice. A no and it's yep. no commitment because you can mm -hmm. cancel our subscription at the end of every month. Oh, that, that, I was just going to ask yeah, that. That's, that uh, that's yeah. important. You're stuck yeah. for a year or three years mm -hmm. or just every no, month. No, no, no commitment whatsoever. But it, the trick is, so suppose you have a car, a second car, for example, in the family. It's not making much, much mileage. It's only used regionally. Uh, so uh, that, that, that kind of situation. You can actually sell your second car and pocket a few thousand euros and get a Beam Me Up subscription plus a lower monthly fee subsequently. So actually it's a negative investment. You get money extra in your pocket and you have lower monthly fees and you have the quality of service. So um, that's when you sign on to Beam Me Up. So now you, if you, for some reason you need to cancel your subscription, then you need the mobility, you need to get a, your own car so you need to spend a few thousand euros plus subsequently you have higher monthly fees. So you have negative investment get, getting into Beam Me Up and you have a significant investment to convert back into your private car. Hmm. And ultimately that's, that drove a lot of people from their DVD player onto Netflix. Yep. And it's thinking it's very into very long term, that. Frank and Dirk. So imagine you you got it done. You know the whole Netherlands is using BMAP, and the people are start selling their old cars. <laughs> Where are they going? <laughs> yeah, Who is going like to buy East, it? East Europe. <laughs> Eastern Europe, indeed. Uh, so that that's going to happen. So the the, the second the, the market for used cars will just collapse. Yeah, that's and, uh, was, just like and, the market for for video recorders and DVD players collapsed. Yeah, you can't mm -hmm. sell them anymore, even though you had the most advanced uh, system, say ten years ago. It's worth nothing. Right. But uh, <laughs> to the advantage of car owners now, we have the export. So Africa, yeah. Eastern Europe, uh, South America. Exactly. Uh, and. And are you only seeking investment or are you also seeking support with business development or seeking partners or penetration into new markets? Like, for example, I was thinking when you were talking, I was thinking in Europe, we are already saturated with cars, but there are countries which still are not saturated with cars. And if they get saturated with cars, then we are all doomed. Countries like China, India, Indonesia. Are you also thinking about that scale or you are still only here? and maybe in 10 years or 15 years good thinking then uh, i like that uh, because indeed uh, this model should not be limited to the netherlands and germany or switzerland it could go anywhere so our intention is to provide franchise services so yep. we provide the platform the operations uh, the whole the whole model uh, and we provide that to to any other country uh, to be operating in and then we could actually uh, also develop roaming services. So you have your local uh, subscription in Switzerland. You take a high-speed train to Moscow or Beijing or, or whatever, or, or a plane for that matter. And you get out of the plane and you take your subscription for the local tail transportation oh. uh, uh, in a roaming fashion, just like you do currently with your mobile subscription. So uh, indeed, our objective is to make this available everywhere. And uh, if they don't develop themselves, then we provide a franchise construction for that. So and are you at this moment looking for such partners and penetration of new market? Because you know our viewers are from all over the world. Yeah, so we are already in discussion with uh, parties. 
in Belgium, in Finland, in Spain, in Canada. So, yeah, we are looking for uh, uh, also uh, parties who are looking to operate this model in, in their countries as well. Mm -hmm. I mean, your idea is not so complicated, and I always say all genius is simple. <laughs> so why hasn't done anyone before something like that? Well, it's a tunnel vision. I, I can't explain it uh, anywhere else, uh, because to me, indeed, like, similar to yourself, it's, it's that obvious uh, that we need to change it. I mean, Ben, you, you, you said in the introduction, uh, so... Cars are currently uh, sitting idle for 96% of the time. You spend tens of thousands of euros on it. So, so it's a disruption waiting to happen. Um, I think so, uh, if I may um, uh, add mm -hmm, to of that. Course. I think um, it's always about implementation. I think somebody may have had this idea before, but hasn't implemented it. And we've seen now with COP26 as well. A clever idea is not implemented yet. And what we want to do here is actually implement it. So this is why we are looking for investors. Uh, we are determined to do this, um, to really actually implement it. Mm -hmm. okay. That's great. That's great. I love the determination. <laughs> <laughs> Last question. Guys, the time is running. In your opinion, who will be or is your greatest competitor in the world or in Netherlands? Very important uh, question, of course, uh, Sveta, thank you. Um, and I think we shouldn't only consider the Netherlands in that question. Um, I mean, one of the obvious competitors is Uber. And mm -hmm. um, uh, we think we have a better offer than Uber because uh, we have our own drivers and our own fleet. We provide reliability because we have subscriptions. We talk about club members. So mm -hmm. it's almost like we are a family. We are far more committed to our club members than, uh, than in the Uber system. Mm -hmm. Um, we are also better than the car sharing, like like share now, uh, because our club members don't need to walk into the street somewhere to find a car, and yeah. when they return to find a parking space somewhere in the street. Uh, so we think we are better than car sharing offers. Um, public transport, I mean, how convenient is that, and how long does that take? So we are better than public transport, and we are cheaper than taxi. So the real competitor. Is not any one of those. The real competitor is the private car, your car. Mm -hmm. That's the competitor. And um, I think the, the, the convincing that we are doing now in, in telling the story is, is to make it clear to people that um, operating their own car is actually the nuisance. And if they come to be me up, it would be so much better. Mm -hmm. I think you need a strong story that people would not be kind of ashamed saying, I have no car, you know. <laughs> you know th that's why I also <laughs> found the story of Frank very good when he said you can sell off your second car and use that as, a, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So it's, so uh, yeah, we are coming to the end. Yes, we want the um, time call to quickly. action. Can you say, uh, Derek, we start with you because Till now, we have always started with Frank. What would be your call to action to all our viewers? Well, I think I think the call to action is uh, there are two things, and and I'll just deal with the the customer part. I would just like to uh, to call on all customers out there to really think about how big of a nuisance it is uh, to operate your own car at this point. Taking it to the cleaners, to the maintenance, to tire changes, and all of this, it actually is a nuisance and it is expensive. And I'd like you to think about this, how you can not only have a far more convenient service, than all, but also a service that is far cheaper. So consider beam me up, join us on our road to making the world a better place. Thank you very much, awesome. Derek. <laughs> and Frank? Yeah, we... Um... As I explained, we want to make our subscribers climate heroes by providing them excellent mobility on a near zero carbon footprint without compromise, without sacrifice. Being a climate hero, hero never was so comfortable. In order to deliver that, we need a few superheroes who will provide the finances to get us off the ground. And like our subscribing heroes, the financing heroes will find the trip with us very rewarding. Let's go.
Thank you very much. I love much. it. Let's go. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you both for joining us today. It was really amazing discussion. And we wish you all lots of good success with the project. I'm sure we will know how it uh, went. And uh, as a little thank you, we will offer you a membership on Chamomile. Just uh, register and we will upgrade it. Thank you very, very much for joining us. <laughs> and thank, uh, thank you, you very much for giving us the opportunity to um, share our vision with you and uh, happy to be on this event. Absolutely. Sure. <laughs> we, we are looking for the right in Netherlands. If we go there, I would love to visit this <laughs> municipality. The first the, the, one. The, there's only five people and ten cows there. It doesn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'd love to come to Switzerland uh, as soon as possible as well. So uh, hope to meet you there. Th that would be perfect. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you, Frank. Thanks, Dirk. <laughs> All right. Bye-bye. <laughs> so, dear viewers, with this, our show of today, the 10th episode of Season 3 ends. If you like our show and you want to be kept informed, please subscribe on the YouTube channel, youtube.com slash Swiss Impact. <laughs> So next week, we'll be having two power women entrepreneurs, Karen Fuchs. Finally, I feel a bit <laughs> alone last lately. <laughs> with the company Sunheart Business Leaders, who puts ethics into the center of any business, in addition to impact. And Francisca Mesche from Sweden with the most sustainable sports beer. So to all sporty ones, <laughs> don't miss that one. Yeah. And yeah, to all our SMEs, entrepreneurs, join the next courses on Chamomile. Thank you for watching us today. Stay fit and act for your future. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> Welcome to Season 3 of Swiss Impact with Ben Ajit. I'm Sveta. And I'm Ben. The topic of Season 3 is Impact Investing, the new normal. Do you also want to do something meaningful for our planet and people or invest with impact? And our amazing and powerful guests who are business owners, heads of financial institutions, thought leaders, political leaders, policy makers, investors, and experts. Greetings, my name is Ash Pachori, and I'm the senior mentor of the POP or Protect Our Planet movement, and also a member of the board and secretary treasurer of the World Sustainable Development Forum. Our primary goal is to mobilize the 1.8 billion youth of the world to urgently address the issue of climate change and take action to protect our planet. This will inspire you to get engaged. And in this season, we will challenge them even more to take actions towards sustainable development goals to enable paradigm shifts in the financial sector and way of doing business. Watch and learn how can we, as humans, transform into eco-financial system which would serve all people and the environment. We aim for impact investment to become available to anyone, become truly mainstream. See you every Friday at 3 p.m. Central European time at Swiss Impact with Energy. Act for your future.